Ladies and gentlemen, today I have something a little strange for you. Or personally, I fancy it will be a little strange for you. It's less strange for me, but it's also um, definitely embarrassing. Um, because I've unearthed a voice from the past. Um, from, to be precise, 14 years ago in the past. And um, we're going to be playing that voice. And it's a voice which dares to address individual nations like France or England in a rather personal and indeed pompous ways like this. France, even though you rejected Catholicism, I can feel how your society is still shaped by Catholic sacramental Christianity. When I returned to Britain recently, it was so clear to me, Britain, Britain with all your ancient, sophisticated depth and grandeur, that you were a Protestant country. Yes, that voice is my own, from when I was living in France 14 years ago. And soon, we're going to be hearing a little bit more of that voice in this episode. Two minutes, a very key two minutes. But alas, if you stay around for future episodes, we're going to be hearing a lot more of that voice. Um, also video, we're going to be seeing video footage of me as I was 14 years ago, um, here in this episode too. And why do I say alas? Well, it is because I'm embarrassed. I do have um, misgivings about this um, old video footage that I've unearthed, and yet it also feels important. I hardly know how to explain this to you, but maybe I could start by saying this. When I unearthed this video, this old video of me, as maybe half an hour of it and all, I was, I was shocked. I really couldn't believe some of the things I was saying on this video. And particularly, particularly, um, what I'm saying in the little two minute thing that we're going to be going into today. Because particularly in these two minutes, this little two minute essence I have for you today, it's like it foreshadowed in some ways what the next 14 years of my life have been about. Um, for me, <laughs> there's something prophetic in these 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 two minutes uh, because just in these two minutes I see um, the essence of I almost want to say what my whole life and work and books and the work on this channel is about now that work has a great deal to do with the Chester Belloc project of a hundred years ago now I mean above all Belloc but also increasingly Chesterton as well. And yet, as I'll be saying in this episode, um, when I filmed um, this material all those years ago, I had never even read Belloc. This footage, um, it struck uh, me as almost uncanny. But anyway, before we come to that, um, that sort of uncanny two minutes, uh, there are a few things I need to say first. And where I'd like to start with that is the simple little idea of comparing experience, comparing one's life experiences. I think that everything I'm doing in my books and videos is in some way um, rooted in that. And we all do that, of course, you know, not just authors and commentators and things like that. So what do I mean? My work is rooted in comparing life experiences. I'll give you some examples. Uh, many things that I'm saying on this channel have to do with comparing my life experience as a new ager in terms of what happened after I entered the Catholic mystery and found something infinitely richer than I ever knew in all those years of, of the new age. You know, or there is, for example, comparing the experience um, of the old mass, you know, the, the Latin mass, and the new mass, 
which after comparing it for many years, um, I have to say that obviously I'm with the very, very grave deficiencies of the new mass. Um, but for me, friends, this didn't all happen at once. You know, as I've said before on this channel, I didn't just automatically convert from New Age to Catholic. And even after I became a Catholic, it took years for it to sink in what these profound differences were. Um, you know, I was still caught up in sort of New Age ideas that, you know, all spirituality is the same and ridiculous things like that. But, but that's not the point here. Um, or, you know, with the old liturgy, I went to the, my first Latin Mass in 2001. This was long before um, Samorum Pontificum. And for years, although I was deeply moved by that Mass in 2001, for years I went thinking, oh, Roger, you know, the new Mass can't be that deficient, can it? You know, why does 99.5% of the Church, you know, uh, believe differently from you? But as I compared my experience over the years, I became convinced in the grave deficiency of the new Mass. Another form of comparing experience that has been very important for me, and I've spoken about it on this channel before, is that um, I'm some sort of American. I don't always know exactly what kind of American I am, um, but I was born in America of British parents, uh, I moved, um, you know, um, my father brought me back to Europe or brought, you know, came back to Europe and I came with him um, as a teenager. Um, so I have the experience in my life of comparing America and Europe. And um, I know in some ways what it's like to see Europe from outside of Europe, uh, because I come from outside of Europe. Um, even though my roots are, are English, but I also, you know, now know what it's like to see America from the outside. And I've done a lot of comparing and contrasting there. There's an episode I did on this channel. It's episode 23. I think it's called An American Moves to Europe. And um, I actually would like to point you friends um, to that episode, partly because I'm very fond of the episode. It's one of my favorites. But also this particular episode is very relevant in terms of what I mean to explore in this episode and in the next upcoming episodes. Because in the next upcoming episodes, we will very much be talking about Europe. But what I really want to get to is this old video footage from 2008. Video footage of a very different Roger that <laughs> I wonder if it will shock some of you. Um, you'll see, you know, this sort of disheveled, wild and woolly man um, pontificating, I think, in rather pompous and melodramatic tones. Um, and this Roger from 2008, um, he's still, still, he's a Catholic, but he still hasn't thrown off all his, you know, New Age attitudes. You'll be, if you stick around these episodes, um, the upcoming two or three episodes, um, you'll be hearing a lot from him, for better or worse. Um, but right now, as I say, I really want to focus in on just a small part of what we have to offer. And so I'm going to present you um, just a little bit more of my old self. England, it feels that Christianity was able to make a home for capitalism much more easily in you, England. But when I contemplate you, 19th century Catholic France, it seems to me that you were trying to guard something very sacred. All right, that was just another um, 20 seconds or so. Soon we'll have the entire two minute set of clips that I, that are the centerpiece of this episode. A centerpiece that, as I say, startles me and expresses so much of the essence of what this whole channel is about. Before I get to that, I want to say how this came about. I was living in France, but I had made a trip back to England. And I remember this trip even now. Um, the video I'd forgotten, but the trip back to England I remember. And 
Again, I exaggerate a little bit, but it was almost like seeing England for the first time. You know, to sort of have an echo of T.S. Eliot. You know, you go back to the place you started, um, because, you know, I do. You know, my blood is English. And you're sort of seeing it for the first time. I exaggerate a little, but I was so hit. At that point, I had been living for years in Catholic cultures, in Catholic France, in Catholic Spain, and Catholic Ireland, or you can say post-Catholic cultures if you want, but I had been living in these post-Catholic cultures, Spain, France, Ireland, but which are still very Catholic in, in some profound way. That's what we're getting at here. Um, and I went back to England, and I could see, I could feel um, the spirit of Protestantism in a, in a way that shook me. I, I, I can remember that. What I don't remember is what I said on the video that you're about to see. And as I say, I'm startled by it. Another reason why I'm startled by it, friends, is that as I say, um, I'm not even yet, in my opinion, fully really Catholic at this point. And one thing that I have never done at this point is that I don't know Hilaire Belloc at all. The Roger who falls in love uh, profoundly with the great Hilaire Belloc, he isn't here yet. He doesn't come along until 2012. Um, and yet the things I'm saying here are very Belocian. I'm really shocked that I'm saying really Balochian things. England, it feels that Christianity was able to make a home for capitalism much more easily in you, England. I mean, all this stuff about capitalism being fostered um, by Protestant Britain while being hindered, the capitalist spirit being hindered by Catholic France, um, this is pure Belloc. This is stuff Belloc goes into for hundreds of pages in his books, and I haven't read any of them. No, I didn't know about this at all. And even after I discovered Belloc uh, years later, it still took me years to realize that really maybe um, this is the major key to Belloc. His lifetime of experience comparing and contrasting Protestant England and Catholic France. I mean, think about it. This great Catholic thinker who was born in France um, of an English mother, uh, but moved to England when he was quite young, but his whole life. He lives in Sussex. He lives near the English Channel, and he just keeps going back and forth, back and forth across the English Channel, and I've come to realize that he was feeling uh, very deeply and a very sensitive soul. Um, and I'm sure far more acutely than I ever will. Um, what I, I'm feeling in this video that so startled me. But the point is, is that I didn't really know that I was thinking these things back in 2008. Um, I didn't, you know, I hadn't read Belloc. No, this is more something that has emerged for me in the last 14 years. And I'll just say this as well. Um, when I recorded this, I had just come out of a spiritual retreat in Paris Le Monial, which, as I've said before, is the town in France where the revelation of the Sacred Heart of Jesus happened to St. Margaret Mary Alico. And um, I dare to believe the, the, the experience, the kind of experience of going to England, sort of feeling like I was seeing England for the first time, I'm wary of being a little bit over the top, but it, it did feel a bit like that, combined with this spiritual retreat in Paré le Monial, um, led me in some way to what I'm about to say here. And I know that what I'm about to say here will sound controversial to some of you. Some of you will think that I'm seeing things that aren't there, or feeling things, that reading things into it. I've struggled with these things a lot over the last 14 years, and Belloc, Belloc has helped me. I've seen that more and more this is what Belloc was doing. 
he was comparing and contrasting Protestant culture of the Anglosphere, England, with Catholic culture. And his work is filled with rich insights um, of his comparison, his comparing and contrasting, but I'm getting ahead of myself. I want to invoke Belloc, but explain this later. Right now, what I want to do is give you two minutes, two minutes of this um, hippie freak, new age, still new age, disheveled, um, <laughs> I want to say maniac, I'm being over the top, um, um, raving and drooling, no, I'm kidding, um, about France and England, about Protestant culture, about Catholic culture. I also speak about Ireland, because Ireland, I, I was in Ireland before I went to France, and um, Ireland, I, I can't even begin to tell you, um, ladies and gentlemen, what I owe to Ireland. So there's a few thoughts about Ireland here in these strange two minutes. France, even though you rejected Catholicism, Catholic Christianity, perhaps more than any other Catholic country, your Catholic roots, I can feel how your society is still shaped by Catholic sacramental Christianity. When I returned to Britain recently, it was so clear to me, Britain, Britain with all your ancient, sophisticated depth and grandeur, that you were a Protestant country. I could feel Protestantism deep down in your roots. You were so different from France. And my whole life seems to have brought me to you, France. It seems to me that you hold something for the world. I look at your 19th century history, and it is so different from the British history that I have been with for so many years. In Britain, there is a phrase that expresses so much. One speaks about the Church of England as the Tory party at prayer. And when I contemplate you, Victorian, Anglican, Protestant, England. It feels that Christianity was able to make a home for capitalism much more easily in you, England. But when I contemplate you, 19th century Catholic France, it seems to me that you were trying to guard something very sacred. Yes, 19th century Catholic France, I see your shadow. But it seems like you were trying to guard something that I don't feel in the Protestant countries I grew up in. I don't feel it in America. I don't feel it in England. I began to feel it in Ireland. In Ireland, I felt this profound, profound Catholic culture, full of shadows and horror, full of prayer and piety. All right. Before moving on, I just want to confess something, and that is that that um, old footage has been edited a little, and the images have been overlaid. Um, that's partly because I'm so embarrassed uh, by that old footage, uh, but it's also because um, overlaying the images like that um, illustrates the themes that I'm trying to get at here, and those themes have to do with the experience, my personal experience, of comparing and contrasting Protestant and Catholic culture. And I want to emphasize personal experience because when I said these things, it was not based on things that I'd been reading in books. Um, I really want to elaborate that. And I want to start with, you know, what I say about Ireland there. Um, because at that point, I'm in France, but I've lived, obviously, in Ireland beforehand, and Ireland had this profound impact for me. Uh, moving there, I moved there in 2004, uh, first of all, um, and that was the first time that I felt I really stepped out of, you know, um, 
Protestant culture. I had been a little bit in Catholic Switzerland, but let's leave that aside for now. I really stepped out of my Protestant, Anglo-American roots. Um, and what I felt in Ireland, the Catholic mystery, just really deeply penetrated me there. And I... I don't quite know how to talk about this on this channel, friends. I'm aware, putting it gently, might put it more severely in a moment, not too severely, uh, I hope, but putting it gently, um, I am aware that it seems to me that I am just having personal experience um, of Ireland that is very different from some people's you know, personal experience, and why should mine be more valid than anyone else's? Um, but I'll say this, my personal experience of Ireland um, is obviously affected by this comparison and contrast of living in different cultures. Um, it's affected by things like, you know, having um, parents who were actually very anti-Catholic, um, I didn't even realize how anti-Catholic they were until I converted to Catholicism and it deeply upset my, my father. Um, God rest his soul. Um, you know, I began to see this deep, deep current of anti-Catholicism that goes back in England, you know, for generations, um, back to the Tudors. These are things that, you know, many Irish people, you know, they don't have an experience of. You know, if I say things more severely, I hope not too severe, I begin to worry that uh, many people these days are so much staring into their smartphones or staring into computer screens that they're experiencing the virtual globalized world more than, dare I say, the real world. Um, and this, this virtual globalized world, um, well, the architects, the architects are out of the Anglosphere. Um, you know, the French, the French speak about Google, Apple, Facebook, Amazon, GAFA, G-A-F-A, because they sense this, you know, profoundly American culture. Uh, these American multinationals coming in and, and shaping their culture. I, I confess, I rather wish the Irish were more conscious of that too. Again, this whole issue of GAFA, I go into this in episode 23. I hope I'm not being overly severe to modern internet culture, or to any of my viewers who are undoubtedly getting great benefits from their smartphones or have to carry their smartphones. Um, you know, it's, you know, for me, just for me, if I had this modern existence, and I don't, where I was obligated to carry around a smartphone, it would be like, take me to the nut house and throw away the key. But obviously, other people aren't like that. Um, they really can handle these things, and some people indeed are doing great work with these things. But the real point here is to try to talk about um, the way I'm, I'm experiencing the world. And I want to come, um, come now to this time in France. Um, in this time in France, back in 2000, 2008, I didn't even own a computer. I um, wasn't on the internet at all. Um, and I do think that allowed me, I'll be saying more about that in episodes to come, by the way, that how I lived in France and, you know, didn't even own a computer, it wasn't on the internet. It's important to things I'm going to unpack here. But anyway, to get to the point, here I am in France in 2007, and I'm experiencing this French Catholic culture. Um, you know, you go into the great um, old cathedrals like Notre Dame or Amiens or Chartres um, in France, and you can be in Catholic, these great Catholic cathedrals um, where the Eucharist has been celebrated for a thousand years. 
And um, there's a very special quality there. You know, here in Ireland, here in Ireland, those things were destroyed by, you know, people like Henry VIII and um, Oliver Cromwell. You know, the Irish don't really have that. But I was feeling, feeling that in, in France. You know, a thousand years of almost unin uninterrupted Catholic culture. Um, and I was also listening to the French. And, um, you know, there's a stereotype, the stereotype that the French have about the English. Um, that if you listen to the French about the English, they will tell you that the English are phlegmatic. And what they mean by phlegmatic, I think, is that the British are nice, calm, reasonable people, maybe a little bit too calm, a little bit like not animate enough, animated enough for French tastes. I'm not really going to go into French stereotypes here. Um, stereotypes obviously um, point to something, but you can't say that, you know, all British people are phlegmatic like this, or all aspects of British culture are like this. Um, but in my view, you can't just completely throw away the stereotypes either. Um, but anyway, the point is, is that when I came back to England, for this visit and it was like I was seeing England um, almost <laughs> like for the first time I could feel something of what they meant this kind of Protestant spirit um, that did feel you know a bit dry I recall being in a in a Anglican college going back to an Anglican college in Cambridge where I used to live um, and the chapel there a Protestant Anglican chapel, um, and I could feel this English Protestant quality. I could feel it very acutely. And then what happens after that, um, ladies and gentlemen, as I intimate in those, as I've intimated, is that I would have come back and I would have gone into a spiritual retreat at Paray Le Monial, which is a place that fosters, at least for me, profound silence and in that silence at Paré Le Monial I think that I was feeling feeling these differences between France and England between Catholic and Protestant culture even more deeply because if you take time to really go into silence you may start to feel things that you will never feel, or at least I will never feel, in all the buzz and electricity of the modern world. And um, that's definitely something we're going to be saying more about in future episodes as well. Now, before we go on, uh, I want to offer a brief note of self-awareness here, uh, because I'm aware of something here, uh, ladies and gentlemen. I'm aware that what I'm doing here, um, among other things, is making assertions. I'm asserting things based on my own personal and um, subjective experience. And I'm aware that people will do different things with these assertions. Some of you may think, well, what Roger's saying um, accords with how I experienced the world and some people may be scratching their heads and thinking well I don't know about that um, you know it doesn't seem to agree with anything I've experienced um, I'm just proposing things here for you friends I'm not aiming to convince anyone here of um, anything that they can't feel or can't resonate with but um, that that's what we're doing on this channel and in a moment, I'm going to be reading you something. I'm going to be reading you something that I discovered um, many years later from the great, in my view, Hilaire Belloc. Uh, this is his biography of Napoleon, a uh, controversial biography, <laughs> um, but um, hadn't read any of these kinds of things, where Belloc is really writing about France um, based on his experience of France. And Belloc is making all kinds of assertions. 
based on his experience. A um, hundred years ago, when he was writing in Britain, um, Belloc came from the position of being very much um, something of a world traveler. He'd traveled all over Europe. Um, he'd actually tramped across America when he was young, uh, where he married his Irish-American um, wife. Um, so he was married to an American. Um, and he, he knew, you know, the Middle East and Africa. Um, but really, the man traveled and traveled and traveled. And in my experience, he was an acutely, acutely aware man who um, isn't often given all the credit he deserves. I do think that part of that, not all of it, but is that, you know, people who haven't traveled the world as much as he has, and, and I haven't either, um, may not feel these differences. You know, so the British people of, of his time, they didn't know what France was like. They didn't know what Italy was like, or Spain, or the Catholic Europe, or Ireland. Ireland Belloc had Irish blood as well. He went to Ireland a lot. Um, but Belloc, Belloc was going to all these European countries, and he was feeling things. And when, after, after um, these, these strange two minutes that I've shared with you, I started to read Belloc, um, I saw that the things he was feeling about Europe were the same things that, you know, I was feeling. They echoed for me. They resonated for me. I'm going to read you a section from Belloc um, from 90 years ago, um, where Belloc is making assertions. I mean, he's also arguing from reason, but he's making assertions. Anyway, I'm going to read it slowly, um, and um, I may abridge it slightly, but anyway, here we go. Everyone knows that religion, whatever its form, exercises a strong effect upon the character and action of individuals. Everyone will, upon reflection or observation, though not usually at first sight, appreciate that the corporate effect of religion upon groups of human beings is a notable factor in the formation of society. The truth, he says, is that the difference of religion is at the root of difference in social culture. The difference between this nation and that, this district and that, this society and that may largely be explained by difference of race, of climate, of instruction, of opportunity, and the rest. But there remains one permanent and profound cause of difference, which is superior to all the others, though it acts in a fashion remote and concealed, and that is difference in philosophy, in the attitude towards the universe, and consequently in the direction of human action, in the moulding of human motive. And, and here's a key thing, key, very key to what he's saying and very key to what I'm going to be saying on this channel more and more, ladies and gentlemen. This is true long after the original beliefs, the doctrines of this or that religious system have ceased to be observed universally. It remains true when they have ceased to be held by the great bulk of men who were once affected by them. The ethics, the social habits of a group survive the doctrinal influence which brought them into being. Something remains, something very strong, of that atmosphere and condition under which a society has grown and been molded. Um, hence, it is true that in Europe, while you have contrasts of race and of climate, um, often general and vague, while you have more immediate and 
obvious contrasts of political organizations and aims, you have at the very foundation of things a still more permanent and effective contrast of cultures. There is the Northern, which may be called a Protestant culture, and there is a Catholic culture, the chief place in which has been held successively by Spain and by France with rivalry at Vienna. And he goes on to speak about the Greek church or orthodox culture of the East and makes a little note about Russian autocracy. Yeah, maybe I'm making a very small allusion to current events in the world, although don't read too much into them. There's maybe a deep conflict between a Russian spirit formed by orthodoxy and an Anglosphere, above all Anglo-American, the backbone of NATO, formed by Protestantism. I'm not really competent to go into that. I personally uh, cannot um, cipher out all the propaganda coming from Moscow and all the propaganda coming from Washington or Google, Apple, Facebook, um, Amazon. Not to mention the massive media conglomerate, Time Warner. And in addition to that, um, I'm going to um, just read something, I'll, I'll bridge it again slightly, that Belloc writes about Calvinism. Just a very short, abridged quote here. Um, so again, he's speaking about how the doctrines in um, a country may have lost their original vitality. Um, but he goes on to say, a nation once Calvinist in creed may have ceased for the most part to believe in predestination or to trouble about conversion and the reprobate sense. But it will continue, he asserts, for generations, and probably until a new set of doctrines shall be taught it, to think in a Calvinist manner. It will incline to the Calvinist attitude upon wealth and the inquirement thereof. It will concentrate upon the responsibility of the individual to himself, the isolation of soul. Uh, this, is, this is something that Belloc would be emphasizing a lot. Protestant cultures tend to a certain isolation of the soul, a certain individualism. You go to France today and they're talking about you know, the Anglosphere with its Protestant roots. You'll hear many, you know, at least Catholic French, French traditionalists certainly speak about the hyper-individualism um, of the Anglosphere. Hyper-individualism. And that's very much the same thing that Belloc is getting at here when he speaks about um, the isolation of the soul in Calvinist culture. And while we're on this topic, um, I'm going to give a certain nod, a nod of respect to my friend Charles Coulomb, um, because Charles Coulomb has many good things to say about this. Um, you know, if you watch this channel, you'll see my not-so-subtle marketing ploy, um, that I have my three books on the bookshelf behind me, um, but there's another book there, and I, I didn't really consciously plan it out this way, but if you look next to my core Jesu Sacritissimum, um, you'll see um, Charles Coulomb's book, Puritan's Empire. And that's a book from um, a sort of history of America from a Catholic perspective, um, where Charles is arguing that, you know, America, you know, obviously started out hundreds of years ago as a nation of Puritans, and he's suggesting that, in many ways, hundreds of years later, America is still a nation of Puritans. Um, you know, as the French say, uh, plus ça change, plus c'est la même chose. 
yeah, the more things change, the more they stay the same. Um, but anyway, yeah, um, that book comes highly recommended. It's a book with all kinds of rich insight and also love. The book was obviously a labor of love for Charles over many years, and the book has love for America and love for the church. Um, while we're still on this same, perhaps controversial subject, um, I'll just note one more thing, um, and that is that we actually touched into this in the last episode, um, because I was speaking about, yes, how the French, we're talking about French stereotypes again, do rightly or wrongly see a puritanical streak sometimes in American culture. And I was saying, actually in the last episode, that um, even the French left, the French left is disturbed by the, you know, political correctness they see coming out of the American university scene. So you have, um, you know, the French left looking at American political correctness, so-called political correctness, and saying it's destroying French culture. Um, but we won't go into that again. Take a look at the last episode, episode 31, if you're interested. It's hard to know how to say these things. Um, there's a struggle going on here, ladies and gentlemen, uh, because I am concerned that um, some of you will think, and you might be right, I don't know, that I'm overly idealizing France or Ireland or overly um, criticizing or even condemning America. Um, it's something that, you know, needs to be asked. I need to struggle with. Um, I want to say, you know, when I go back to this footage from 14 years ago, I'm speaking in the language of Jung, Jungian language. I'm talking about Ireland's shadow, about France's shadow. Um, all peoples are fallen. They all cast a shadow. Um, and I, I see France's shadow um, very much then as I do now. Um, so many issues here. Obviously, America casts a shadow, and it's being a greater and bigger country than many in the world. Um, it has the potential, at least, to cast a bigger shadow, um, and it has the potential, which it often meets, to do a greater good in the world. Um, but yeah, there's other issues that come into this. It's like um, those who know this channel will know that I am concerned about the what I would call the Anglo-Americanization of Ireland, living here in Ireland, uh, because it's not just Google, Apple, Facebook, Amazon. Um, there's British culture in here too. You know, there's the Beatles, there's the Rolling Stones, Pink Floyd, David Bowie, and you know, here in Ireland, um, obviously, we have the BBC. The newspapers are British. Uh, British, you know, sitcoms and soap operas, which you know you won't get, I imagine, so much in America. Um, so, I am very concerned about the Anglo-Americanization of Ireland, and I do need to speak about it, and it's also one of my life experiences um, that, you know, I first came to, to Europe in 1980, and um, that means that I've had over 40 years now of watching um, what is often, you know, seems to me like, yes, the Americanization of Europe. Um, and I'm actually speaking about that in the old footage, and I wasn't going to run any more of it in this episode, but I've changed my mind. <laughs> um, we're going to run uh, just a little bit more of that um, melodramatic and maybe unintentionally comic um, video from the past, um, just to contextualize um, what I'm trying to say here. In the early 1990s, that Tory government introduced Sunday trading. That is, before that, Britain, like all the rest of Europe, had the shops shut on Sunday, according to a tradition that went back centuries. Life in Britain, it seems to me, changed when that Sabbath day, when that one-seventh of our lives in Britain became commercialized. Peace was lost. Peace was destroyed. 
and now years after Thatcher began to transform Britain along what we could call American directions. Now France begins to follow. France, France, you France, which for so many years seems to me you have had some kind of resistance to this process I call Americanization. I regret calling it Americanization. It seems to me that the country I was born in, America, filled with a certain youth, filled with a certain innocence, I do not want to join with the people who, with such superiority, turn their nose up and look down on America from Europe as if, as if this global sickness that we here in Europe are somehow exempt from. If we are somehow exempt from the same patterns of consumerism and capitalism. No, it seems to me that there is a global evil at work. I might add that when I lived in France, um, I knew a man, a man on the left, um, who was very angry about um, America. He seemed to me so angry that um, he didn't want to travel to America as a tourist. Not because he didn't want to see America, but because he didn't want to um, give money to the American economy by um, spending tourist dollars there. And I don't really want to speak harshly to this man. I, I like the guy, actually. But I am going to say that um, that kind of attitude um, strikes me as problematic, to say the least. No, I'm going to be harsher. It strikes me as ludicrous. If I'm honest, ladies and gentlemen, um, because it really doesn't matter, you know, if you're um, spending money in dollars or euros or pounds. You know, it's all much of a muchness. It's all the same global, global thing. But I'm aware, alas, of saying things that might well sound contradictory. Uh, because there's no denying I have a lot of sympathy with Belloc's analysis that English Protestantism favoured capitalism, while French Catholicism, or Catholicism in general, hinders capitalism. And I am concerned with uh, what the French call GAFA, or I am concerned with, you know, I, I do sympathize with European fears of American political correctness coming out of the American university scene. And alas, at the risk of piling this on even more, my long engagement with the New Age movement only makes how very clear it is that despite its Eastern sources, it is a profoundly um, Anglo-Saxon Protestant phenomenon. You go live in Latin Catholic countries, you won't find it there in anywhere near like the same measure. No, this is a movement with um, deep English roots, a lot of American expansion and American marketing, and it amounts to yet another uh, subtle way that the West is becoming Anglo-Americanized. And um, People seem scarcely conscious of this at all. But none of that is the same as saying that, oh, uh, I think that we should become violently angry with America, because it's, it's hypocrisy. Because, I say it again, um, there are long shadows everywhere, and Europe certainly has plenty of long shadows. Still, what I am saying on this channel is that I am concerned with how much the Protestant, or if you like, post-Protestant Anglosphere does dominate the world, and it certainly dominates Ireland. That's what this, that's what we're talking about here, um, ladies and gentlemen. Um, we're not trying to give some kind of um, global critique or global condemnation of America or the Anglosphere. In fact, I've said before on this channel, that um, the America that I grew up in um, had some very wholesome, wholesome and um, special qualities that I remember that um, you wouldn't find so easily, I think, in many European countries. All right, ideally, I would like to start pulling all the threads together um, now, um, but I can't really. 
I've been suggesting throughout this episode that this episode is only the start of a series of episodes um, where we're going to keep exploring a number of things herein. I mean, first of all, uh, we're going to keep showing um, this embarrassing footage over the next two or three episodes. I uh, definitely want to do that. Um, and while I'm on the subject of that, let me just clarify something. Uh, you'll almost certainly have had the impression that that footage was shot in uh, France. Well, it wasn't. It was actually shot in Switzerland. Um, I had just crossed over into Switzerland for one night and one night only, and I had access to a computer. Um, so that's what we did there, and just to be precise, it's in Switzerland. Um, also to be precise, I said earlier in the episode that I had no computer at this time. Um, that's really basically true. I did have a computer tucked away in storage somewhere, but the entire two and a half years uh, or so that we were living in France, um, no computer, no internet connection, and the world definitely looks different when you're unplugged. Um, and that's also a theme that I wish to continue to develop. Um, but there are other themes that we're going to be continuing about. We're going to keep talking about Europe. We're going to talk about Christendom. Um, and yes, I want to bring out more um, here about what Belloc is saying about capitalism, how the Reformation, the English Reformation, fostered um, Anglo-American capitalism, and how um, he saw France in such different terms, um, because that is also what is really key for me here, ladies and gentlemen, that on this old footage, um, I'm feeling, you know, how different France is in regards to capitalism, um, um, in regards to its history, it didn't go down um, the same route as England. It was so clear to me, Britain, deep down in your roots, you were so different from France. And that's also very significant for something else I want to say here. I'm actually going to close with... Um, <laughs> a capitalistic marketing ploy um, an uncanny marketing ploy what on earth am I talking about well there's a little project I have um, to tell you about um, that I've done and strangely enough it also ties in with all of this um, because um, a while back I was asked to write the foreword um, and it's a pretty extensive forward, it's not just a short forward, um, to a Belloc book that is being republished. Um, it's a book on monarchy. Um, ostensibly, it's a biography of King Louis XIV of France, but it's far more than that. It's an old Belloc book from the uh, 1930s um, that's being republished. And Belloc is not only speaking about monarchy, particularly the French monarchy, he's getting at these very issues that um, I'm getting at here and are present in seed form in these two minutes. Because believe it or not, what Belloc is saying in this book about the French monarchy is that there was something in France that um, protected the French against capitalism. And um, what that was in France was the spirit of Catholic culture, but it was also the French monarchy. So Belloc wrote this very rich book on the French monarchy that goes into all kinds of things. I mean, it's not really just a book about monarchy. It's also very relevant to um, all of Belloc's thinking about distributism and about capitalism. Um, it's been a very important book for me, and I was honoured, I was honoured to be asked to write the foreword a while back. I was honoured by the new Catholic 
publisher, Aroka Press. I think maybe really the highest compliment I can give to them, and it's fully deserved, is that I really see that what Aroka Press is doing is in the spirit of the Chester Belloc, promoting Catholic tradition with an awareness of culture, but also, um, how do I put it? Well, I might say that I do see a difference um, with Aroka Press. A difference from what? Um, well, I don't know how to say it. You know, I don't particularly enjoy um, running down um, good Catholic apostolates, but I am um, concerned sometimes with some of the Catholic apostolates. I see that they could be in danger of being sucked into the commercial spirit of modernity. And what I see at Aroka Press looks like the very antithesis of that. I see great idealism there. Um, the man who's founded it seems to me to be working away in a humble, non-flashy way. Um, that's why it's an honor to write this forward um, um, for the Bellot book um, by, published by Aroka Press. I will put a link down below to Aroka Press so you can check them out if you like. Um, and now, <laughs> I'm so full of contradictions um, because um, having just said that about, you know, falling into the danger of the commercial spirit of modernity, um, I'm going to make a sales pitch. Um, I just want to say that when the book is out, this great Belloc book on monarchy, um, very relevant for understanding Belloc's thinking on capitalism and distributism, um, you know, you might want to take a look at the book, uh, maybe consider buying it. If you do, uh, you'll not only get a great book by Belloc, um, you'll also get my foreword, which is quite extensive. Yeah, it could be like a little booklet in itself, even, um, in theory. And you'll also be supporting the rather remarkable Aroka Press. So, um, I think that's all I'm going to say now, um, ladies and gentlemen, except that, again, we will be continuing. This is but the first of a series of episodes that I want to do um, on Christendom on Europe. I'm also talking about some of the graces God has given me in my in the course of my life of living and experiencing different European cultures. Um, all of this we are going to continue, but for now all I will say is if you've got to the end of this video, um, thank you for watching. Really, thank you for watching um, and God bless you friends. God bless you in these rather troubled times.